Hey guys, it's Bree here from Blossom and Branch. Welcome to the farm. Today we're gonna do a little farm tour around because we have some big changes coming up at the farm. Let's go. All right, you guys have been asking for a farm tour for quite a while, so we're going to start here in the front yard. And the front yard is actually the most recent space that we've done here at the farm. Over here we have some hellebores and some columbines because we have a pine tree up above. And as you know, pine trees create dry shade. Dry shade can be difficult to grow in. It's not actually the acidic conditions, it's the dryness. So columbine and hellebore do really well here under this tree, but let's go check out the fun thing, which is the lavender field. So over here is our front yard and here we have our lavender. So we have planted all phenomenal lavender because it's really clay tolerant. If you wanna learn more about that, we have a whole video on our front yard lavender field. In the rows, we often get a lot of questions about what's in between the lavender. This is actually perennial rye, and perennial rye is planted in here as sort of a cover crop. Our sheep come in and they graze it down, and that helps to keep the soil nice and healthy up here in the front yard. Not that lavender need particularly healthy soil, but we always wanna be thinking about the microbes. Over here are one of my favorite additions to the farm this year. This is kind of a green fence that we've put into place. We don't wanna put in a really solid fence here at our street. We like to facilitate communication with our neighborhood. So putting in something that created a little bit of a barrier and yet was really nice visually was key here. So we put in some raised beds. These are from Birdies and they are the court and steel beds and we've planted zinnias in them. And I love zinnias because they're really easy care and they're drought tolerant. So you can see how well they're growing despite the fact that we very rarely water. So one of the things I love about having the lavender in the front yard is that it's drought tolerant and it's xeric, so we don't have to water it. In fact, I don't think we've watered this once this year, which is really great for our dry climate here in Colorado. And yet this phenomenal lavender seems to be really drought tolerant. So we've actually already done harvest on this lavender. This second kind of sparse bloom that we get here in the fall, we just leave for the pollinators. So we'll occasionally still have bumblebees and bees up here visiting this lavender. We don't do a prune here in the late fall. We actually only do a prune in midsummer. And now we're gonna go ahead and let this grow throughout the winter. It creates a little bit of visual interest during the winter. So that's pretty much all we have here in the front yard. Let's pop over to the main field, which is in the back. Over here, because lavender is actually non-native and we do focus a lot on native plants, we've surrounded the perimeter with native plants. So over here, we have a lot of native grasses. We have blue grama. And over here, we have a whole prairie area dedicated to just native plants. And so what we have up here are a variety of rudbeckia. We have penstemons, salvias. We have some geums up here, lots of echinacea, which reseed themselves quite happily. Now it's here toward the end of the season, so a lot of these are going to seed, and we do leave all of these in place for the finches, especially over the winter. They love eating and feasting on these seed heads, and we will also come in and do some seed harvesting so that we can seed some of these throughout the farm. Now here we have some milkweed, and you can see it's gotten quite tall. So we're gonna go ahead and harvest some of these milkweed seeds and share them with our neighbors. But you can see what happens here with, especially the milkweed, is that we get a lot of what they're called oleander aphids. And oleander aphids are these kind of orangey aphids. You can see them here. And what's really interesting with the oleander aphids is that if you leave them in place, and they're very common on milkweed, but if we leave them in place, what will happen is the beneficials will move in really quickly. So you can actually see evidence of that here. So here are the silken strands of some leftover eggs of some lacewings. And lacewings are a great beneficial insect. They eat a ton of aphids, especially when those lacewings are in their larval stage. So if we leave those aphids, especially on a plant like this, a sacrificial plant, if you will, then we will see the ladybugs, the lacewings, all those things start to move in. So we find that Creating these pockets of natives is really helpful for the pest population overall and helping keep the beneficial insects coming. This is mountain mint, a really beautiful one, and we have some great asters back here as well. But let's go check out the main attraction, which is what's going on in the back. Okay, so now we have passed through the gates and we are back here in the main part of the farm and it is a disaster back here right now for a reason. We are getting ready to do a big project, which is part of the reason why I've been so quiet on YouTube, is that we have been really, really busy trying to get all this prepped. So you can see here all of this concrete. This was all put in about 30 years ago here at the farm before we owned it. And 
it's way more concrete than we need. So we're reclaiming all of this concrete space is going to become landscaped, it's going to become planted, and I can't wait. But part of that is that we've been moving our garage, which is over here. We've moved our shed and our shop and our storage stuff, which is all over here. So now we have a big open expanse and tomorrow we're going to be taking down all of this concrete and demoing and I cannot wait to have all of this space back. We're also going to be doing a little addition with a workshop space and we can't wait to have a mud room. We're going to be putting in a mud room. So we'll be bringing you guys along on all of these additions and renovations and we're really excited about it. But for now, it's a mess. So this is pretty much our last grassy spot that we left here at the farm. Our whole two acres basically used to be grass and weeds, of course. This is all we have left and this will all be going soon. And over here is where we used to have our raised beds and our greenhouse. You can see right now, this is all destroyed and a mess right now. It's a real life view. There is no curation here. This is what it looks like right now, for real. We have our raised beds that we are right now digging all of the soil out of. We are moving all of the soil and storing it. We are going to reuse all of this dirt because this is pretty much the best dirt we have here at the farm. And we are also moving all of this rock around here to different spots. This whole area over here will be transformed into something else. This is where our sheep, Midnight, and Roosevelt used to hang out. And this house used to have its garage right here, right next to the house, and it went straight out to the street. So we're going back to the roots of our 1930s farmhouse and putting the garage back where it used to go which is, in my opinion, where it always should have been. But in the meantime, lots of mess. All right, this is our cooler. I always get lots of questions about the cooler. Did we build the cooler? No, we actually got this cooler secondhand and we just moved it here. It's actually a shed frame that they have put insulation panels into. And then we have fitted it with a cool bot. And a cool bot is a really great way of hacking an air conditioner so that it doesn't freeze over and it allows you to cool a space down below the set point of a typical air conditioner, which would normally freeze over once those fins get too cold. So it hacks that system. It lets us use just a room air conditioner to keep the space cold. Usually we keep it right around 38. There's not a lot in here right now because we're getting ready to move. So we haven't been doing much at the farm. We've got our onions and our bulbs in there that we just dug up. We'll go take a look at where we dug those daffodil bulbs from. And over on the side, we keep all of our boring things like buckets and tables. We are constantly washing buckets. This is a very common activity here at the farm is just washing these. And then we just store them right around the corner so that they're right where we need them when we need to get to the cooler. Let's go look at the field. So we're passing over our bridge. This is the bridge that leads to the field and it goes across an agricultural ditch. So we get a lot of questions about our water, where we water from. This is an agricultural ditch. We do have 10 shares, which basically equates to 10 watering days a month. Uh, but we don't actually use this water to water the field because it has some unknown contaminants in it. And it's also really silty. So the water that comes out of here is quite muddy and it tends to clog up our drip emitters on our drip system. So we need to invest in a sand filter and bury a tank, which is just quite costly. And we're just not quite at the point yet where we are ready to invest in that system. So right now, we use the ditch to water the lawn, but not to water the field. We actually use city water to do that. Coming this way, this is an area that we have landscaped ourselves. We have some honey crisp trees. So originally this property was an apple orchard. We have our storage container over here right now for all of our stuff as we move out of the house to do our big renovation. But these honey crisp trees are an homage to what used to be here, which was an apple orchard. So we planted quite a few apple trees we have our pergola here that my loving husband built with his own two hands here. And we have created just a little bit of a living space here for our family to enjoy in the evenings. Not that we sit down a whole lot. Over here, we have our vegetable production space. So this is really personal use. I don't really use this for the farm very much. This isn't things that I sell. We have a bunny fence that goes around the perimeter because our bunny population is very healthy here. And in here is where we grow most of our perennial plants. So in here we have our chives and our strawberries and I like to interplant those too because I find that having some onions interplanted helps with pest prevention. So here you can see some of our remaining onions that we haven't harvested yet, they're getting quite large. And we have some strawberries growing right next to them quite happily. So I do like growing these two things together. It seems to work quite well. We will go ahead and harvest these here within the next week or two, but we leave them as long as possible. 
over back behind me, you can see some of our cover crop rows. So we actually had potatoes and onions growing back here, which creates a lot of soil disturbance when we harvest those. So we like to restore that soil by using cover crops. So we have buckwheat, some oats and some hairy vetch growing in here to help replenish that soil. And back here, we actually have our greenhouse. And this is where the magic happens, as they would say. And this is where we grow pretty much all of our seeds here for the farm. So if you haven't already watched our video about the greenhouse, go back and check that out. That video talks about how we grow so many seeds in such a small greenhouse. This is just a six by 10 greenhouse, but we really pack it full. So all of the shelves that are in our cooler move over here to the greenhouse space for the winter. And we set up shelves and we soil block in here. So we start about 14,000 seeds out of this tiny space and it's very efficient. In here we've used brick for the flooring and that's to help with the passive heat. So you can see we've done a nice basket weave flooring. We actually have a video coming up about how we built this greenhouse foundation. That'll be hitting the YouTube soon, but it was actually very simple and this is just a kit greenhouse. And I did go for the glass greenhouse. We talk a little bit about why we chose glass in our greenhouse video, but I just find that it holds up the longevity is just a little bit better than polycarbonate so we grow a lot in here and i love my greenhouse i do like it i wouldn't go for a bigger one because it's hard to heat let's move on to our little prairie areas and the field over here we have one of our native prairie meadow areas so we have a few pocket prairies spread throughout the farm and these are just areas where we've really focused on native plants native grasses so in here we have quite a few beautiful natives growing we have some prairie drop seed in here we have blue grandma, we have echinacea, sedum, which is not native, but it is xeric, lots of asters, and those beautiful purple asters are such a pollinator favorite at this time of year. Milkweeds in here, we have big blue stem, we have baptisia, and we have some goldenrod in here, some rudbeckia, and we also have some hummingbird mint, and we've seen so many hummingbirds this year with the addition of this hummingbird mint. This has been one of the favorites this year for both the pollinators and the hummingbirds. So this area has been really fun. I'm still honing it a little bit and I'm finding that I tweak it a little bit every year. I do have to hand weed it. It's not zero maintenance by any means. This area over here is a little bit more low maintenance. So this is a mix of Rebecca and we have side oats grandma growing in here, which is another native grass. Pretty low maintenance in here and it's a really great habitat for birds. And same thing over here around the fire pit. So this is one of our first native grass areas that we started and it's still probably my favorite. This is one that we just did a mix of seed and we did prairie drop seed, we did big blue stem, little blue stem. We've done a whole range of different native grasses and you can see how beautiful they are here in the fall is when they really start to shine. So not only do we not have to mow this, it's also low water and it's fairly low maintenance. We really don't do anything with it except for mow it down once a year and we actually let our sheep come in here usually and graze it down and help us with the management of this area. We're getting into the main flower field portion. Go hide those rocks. The kids are creating a geode museum. But right here we have a lot of our rose bushes. So this time of year is when the Japanese beetles have finally waned and they are no longer attacking our roses. So we're finally getting roses again. I might rip out the roses this year. Whole video to come on that. I haven't decided but I am frustrated with the roses and how I really only get three weeks of good rose harvest every year with the Japanese beetles. They've just stopped attacking the roses this week and it is almost October. So we really only get about three good weeks of rose harvest every year before we have to just let them kind of fall victim to the Japanese beetles and deadhead them. But here are most of the roses. We have a whole video about the roses that we select and why, and mostly it's because they are low maintenance, they are disease proof, disease resistant. That's why we grow the roses that we do and because they have nice long stems. So here's a great example of that. You can see this is one of my favorite roses, Queen of Sweden. And it is a pink rose, but you can see how nice and long these stems get. And also they have very few thorns on their canes. So I prefer to select disease resistant, relatively thornless, and also ones with long stems if I'm planting roses. But again, I don't know, I might rip them all out this year. I just, am, I've had it. Here's some peonies. We have some baptisia, and this is one of my favorites for growing native foliage because you can see it makes such a great foliage. It's this fine foliage 
It lasts really well, especially here in the fall. And it makes these really interesting black seed heads. And these are great for the fall use. I like them for Halloween and making wreaths. This is a perennial plant. It gets quite large and it's very pest resistant. So you can see these leaves are basically uneaten. There's maybe a little nibble here and there, but really not much in terms of pest pressure. So down here we have a couple rows. This is our stock row. So what we'll do is we'll rotate and swap out. If we're growing something in the spring like stock, then we'll swap out and we'll cover crop it for the second half of the year. So all of this came out around July and we planted a cover crop here of buckwheat and oats. We've had the sheep coming in here and grazing down some of it. They'll come in here and eat the rest of it down in the fall. And this is a great forage for them. The buckwheat is also really good for pollinators and it's a very low water needs cover crop. So we really like this one. You can see where the sheep have started to eat it down. And this one will go ahead and die off in the winter time. If you wanna learn more about the cover crops, we have a whole course on the regenerative gardening side on our website, blossomandbranchfarm.com. Here we have our lisianthus. So the lisianthus are an annual crop here for us. We don't grow them as perennials. We grow them as annuals. They are a cultivar of a native plant here in Colorado. So they actually do fairly well without a ton of water, especially here as they're established later in the season. And they come in lots of different colors. Some of my favorites to grow are these Voyage. And we have a whole video on growing these Lysianthus from seed, which is the most cost-effective way to do it. But they are one of my favorite cut flowers. And they're also lovely to harvest. They're just very easy to harvest and they bloom for an extended period. So they start blooming at the bottom. So you can see some of these browner ones are the ones that bloom first. And then the bloom moves up the stem and these ones bloom last. So really these have bloomed over a period of about six weeks for us. So a really long bloom period. We do plant them with this netting. Now a lot of farmers use Hortonova, which is a plastic product. We've switched over this year to this product, which is a jute based netting. And here you can see a better shot of this jute netting here. So what we do have to do is sometimes when it rains, it might loosen a little bit. So we'll reattach it here to our hoops and that helps to keep it nice and tight so that we're not having to use as much plastic. And that's something we've done here at the farm overall. We don't use the plastic soil covering anymore. We have a whole video on why we don't do that, but basically we're concerned about microplastics. So. Here we have another row that is establishing a cover crop right now. Usually the first thing to germinate is the buckwheat and you can see that is starting to come up. And down here we have a row of golden currant. So golden currant is an excellent hedgerow. This is native. It not only creates berries that attract birds, but it also creates a bit of a wind block. And we get a lot of wind that comes in here on the front range from the west. So having a wind block hedgerow in between the rows is really helpful and we can use it for foliage. Over here is an area that we really revamped this year. This was all landscape fabric last year and we pulled up all of this fabric. We planted in blue grandma in the rows because these are peonies. And blue grandma is a grass that doesn't really like a lot of traffic. So we planted the blue grandma in here because the peonies really only get traffic in the spring when we're harvesting the peonies. And then for the most part, we don't come in here very often. So there's not a lot of foot traffic happening in here. And we also have mulched around these peonies. We've removed the plastic that we used to have down and we've switched over to a thick mulch system to help keep the weeds down. In between, we have some creeping phlox growing. So hopefully that will help cover the ground and help with the weed reduction. We've also planted lots of native stuff here in between these peonies because the peonies are non-native. We have solidago, we have milkweed, asters, we have some columnar oaks here growing along the edge. So we've tried to really incorporate the native plants here because we have a lot of non-natives going with the peonies. So more of the annuals over here and the zinnias are finally doing really well. And we had to reseed these three times this year because the bunnies kept nibbling on them. So I always succession plant my zinnias. This is a later succession. And you can see they don't have powdery mildew. And I find that that's because we have planted them in multiple successions. So we don't just plant one batch of zinnias, we plant multiple batches. And that way those later ones aren't as infected with that powdery mildew as some of the earlier ones. Down in this row, we have a native shrub. This is called New Jersey tea, and this is actually just its second year. So it's still establishing. You can see we do have some powdery mildew here on this, but this is New Jersey tea and it does bloom as a white bloom in the midsummer when we don't have a ton of filler. So I'm really excited to see that these are starting to finally establish. They will get larger and again, nice white blooms. And over here we have our dahlia, one of our dahlia rows. 
This was the dahlia row that we overwintered. So these have been in the ground since last year. We piled up leaves and tarps to help keep them dry and warm over the winter time. And they did survive, even though we had a very, very cold winter. And these were the earliest ones for us to bloom. So we'll definitely be doing that again. And one of the things that we do for pest management here at the farm, you can see I don't bag my dahlias. A lot of farmers will bag them. I just find that bagging them reduces the profitability because of how much work it takes. But the dahlias are definitely susceptible to these guys. These grasshoppers seem to love eating the dahlias, especially the tips. So one of the things that we do is we utilize nasturtium. So we planted nasturtium here along the base of the dahlias and that's just to serve as a trap crop. So a lot of pests prefer nasturtium over other plants. And so by planting those nasturtium at the base of the dahlias, we are hopeful that that will help reduce the pest pressure. And that does seem to have worked here with our dahlias this year. We have some more lisianthus getting ready to bloom. And then we start getting into our native area of the field. So down on this end is where we started to establish a lot of native perennials. And we're trying to kind of minimize both the amount of work that we're having to do with replanting every year, but also we're trying to serve the pollinators more. So we have some bee balm. We have a whole row of rudbeckia here. A lot of these are perennial rudbeckias. Some of them are not, but they do reseed. So we leave them to reseed and we'll also harvest these seeds. And behind me, we have lots of asters. So not only are asters an excellent pollinator plant, but they're also really nice as a cut flower. So they have this nice purple bloom here at the top. And behind me is where we've dug up all of our daffodils. So this is where we had all of our daffodils planted for the last four years. They have spread to the extent where they needed dividing, but this soil was also really too heavy and I've just stopped focusing on production of daffodils. Our winters are just too inconsistent for daffodils. They just don't do that well here. We tend to have hot, dry springs, they blow open. So we've been digging up all of our daffodils and reselling them. So this area is gonna become something else. I'm not quite sure yet. Usually we do corn or sunflowers or cosmos over here. I'm not sure what we're gonna plant over here yet. This area will all be rehabbed next year. And you can see the soil has really been pretty disrupted. So it's gonna take a, definitely a spring cover crop in here. And I actually might try to get one cover crop in before we get frost here. Here we have some more of our natives. So again, trying to make this side of the field mostly perennials and natives. Here we have perennial oregano and oregano is one of my favorites for fillers because it is excellent in the spring as just a green. And then we get blooms here toward the later part of the year. And then it turns into an interesting seed pod in the fall. So all season here, we get tons of interest from the oregano. Here we have some rose geranium. This is grown as an annual. We could dig it up and keep it over the winter and replant it in the spring. Over here is one of my favorite native grasses. This is Northern sea oat. And it is edible just like oatmeal. Um, you could eat, you could winnow and eat these seeds like oatmeal. They're also just gorgeous. Um, this is a North American native plant and in a lot of areas it's actually endangered and it is a dune stabilizer. So in areas that have a lot of sand, this helps stabilize the sand and the dunes. But you can see how gorgeous these seed heads are here in the fall. They turn this kind of bronzish color and they just make such a beautiful waving motion. They do spread. So if you don't want them to spread, you'd want to deadhead them. You could save the seed, you could eat the seed, but they will spread. <laughs> Over here we have our tunnel. Now this year we kind of let our tunnel rest. In the past it's been a pumpkin tunnel and it's grown pumpkins all the way across. This year we wanted to give it a break from the squash so that we don't get squash vine borers. Right now we don't have a lot of problems with that and I don't want to start. And so we're using crop rotation to try to minimize that. But we will put the plastic greenhouse film back on this so that we can use it in the winter time. But for now, we have these really interesting hyacinth being growing in here. And these are one of my favorites. I love the bloom that they make. And then in the fall, they make this gorgeous purple seed pod. And they're a really interesting textural element. And you can see they actually have a nice long stem and they're a great climber. So we like to use this one for a climbing element. But come down and look at the flower that it makes. So after they change from this flower, then they start to turn into this bean shape. And we're gonna go ahead and save some of those seeds from that this year. 
But this tunnel has been just kind of a mishmash of all kinds of different things this year. I haven't done a lot with it just because I felt like it, it needed a bit of a break from what it had been, which was pumpkins, mostly pumpkins. So this year we're growing the pumpkins over here. So we've got our squash and our pumpkins growing here. We've interplanted our pumpkins, our peppers, and our tomatoes all together this year. And I just do a very simple trellis with the tomatoes. We just do a weave with a rope straight up. And this just helps us to harvest and to keep tabs on our cherry tomatoes. So you can see we just wind right up these ropes. We have a two by four going across that's sunk into some posts. And this just makes it really nice and easy to harvest these tomatoes. And down here we have our pumpkins growing. We have some more peonies back here. We have our pumpkins growing down here. Let's see, do we have any? Oh, here's a giant one. Midnight and Roosevelt have been enjoying these pumpkins, but there's a few that have evaded their grasp. So we're growing these green ones this year, which are really beautiful and great for eating. Down this way, again, lots of natives. So we have a whole row of echinacea. We have a whole row of solid aster, which is a mix of solidago and aster. Another row of dahlias and nasturtium and our chrysanthemums, which are just getting ready to bloom here. And now that I've grown the solid aster for the first time, I realized that it really needs staking. So I did not know when I started growing this one that it was going to flop so badly. So next year, the solid aster will definitely be hooped and supported with netting like the other ones are. Over this way we have our barn. So our barn space is what we use when we have workshops, wreath workshops, classes, those kinds of things. And this was the original horse barn on the property and we moved it from one side of the property to the other because it was rotting where it was and it was actually in a pretty good growing spot. So we wanted it here on this side where it's not so great for growing, but it's a beautiful space. And my husband did a great job doing the floor, putting in windows. All of this was reclaimed materials. The table is often a favorite. And this was actually made from the dividers that used to exist in the barn here. And those were the old horse stalls that we turned into a table. And it just has a lot of history and we really feel a lot of love when we're back here in the barn. So the last thing to check out, we'll go say hi to the sheep and check out the woods. This is midnight on Roosevelt and they are expecting their dinner right now. They are in charge of eating a lot of our weeds, also giving us fertilizer, creating compost. So usually their job comes mostly into play here in the fall when it's time to start eating down cover crops and true to form like very stereotypically midnight who's the black sheep is kind of a jerk and roosevelt who's the white sheep is a pretty good sheep so it's just classic that this this one is very sweet this one is the mischief maker roosevelt's a good boy and we do shear them in the spring and we're gonna be actually washing their wool here this week and probably turning it into something. I'm not sure what. So we'll actually usually use their bedding, their leftover straw and their manure kind of as the walkway covers in the field. And we'll compost it right in place in the walkways. And then after a couple of years, we'll shovel it onto the beds. So it gives it time to age. And that way we're not making the beds too hot with too much nitrogen, but it's a great way for us to close the loop here on the farm, utilize regenerative systems. They graze down our cover crops and they help regenerate our soil. Over this way is the woods. So we have half an acre that is basically just dedicated wildlife habitat, mostly for the birds. And when we moved in, it was covered with invasive plants um, such as common buckthorn, wild honeysuckle, tree of heaven, Canadian thistle, yeah. we had hoary cress, white top, um, just tons of invasive plants. So yeah. pretty much the first four years were dedicated to removing a lot of those invasives. So every year we come through a couple times a year, we cut down a bunch and we chip it. And what has been coming back has been these American plums that are really great for attracting birds and attracting those birds is key to our pest management system. So because we don't use pesticides, having the birds here on this side of the farm really helps us in the field. 
So not only do we have a lot of bird habitat back here, our kids love to play back here. It's a little bit wild. We've been working on restoring a lot of the native grasses. So we've been taking out a lot of those weeds and planting things like blue grandma. Chickens. We have chickens. That's right. Let's go check out the chickens. And let's see if they're laying any eggs. Let's see if they've laid any eggs. So we have chickens over here. My husband turned this old kids play set that we got for free <laughs> into a chicken coop. And the chickens are not only great for obviously providing us fresh eggs, but they're also great for helping us with our grasshopper population. So if we set the chickens loose in the field, they will usually go for the grasshoppers. Yes. See any today? We think that already got them. I think that got them already. But so this chicken coop is a really great way to turn some yeah, an old really unused has chickens. It really has chickens too. What are the chickens names? Fluffy and potato. So back here a little bit deeper in the woods we also have some owl boxes. So um, last year my husband built me a great horn owl box. A great horn owl box up here. So just to help us with things like rodents and rats and mice because we have the chickens, rodents can often be an issue. So we put in this great horned owl box and we do have a family of great horned owls that hangs out here in the winter time and they definitely help us with our mouse population. And this is our last frontier back here. So we've been working on kind of the wooded area. We our planted a cover We planted a cover crop back here and next year this is going to probably become our food forest. We've been kind of trying to work on it every year, but we finally got all of the invasive trees mostly removed from this area. So we're going to tackle this area next year. Oh, sounds like a lot of work. All right, guys, that's it here at the farm. We're going to go in and do bedtime because tomorrow is moving day and then we're going to start demo day on our concrete and we're super excited. Thanks for coming along on the tour and I hope you guys will tune in for all these exciting renovations we have coming up here this even winter. Even the cool gems. Even we cool can gems. Plant. Even you can check out our cool gems. All right, and guys. You can come back don't forget next. If you, and you can also check out the cool gems we collect and find. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you liked this video. And we'll see you guys around here at the farm soon. <laughs>